Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, my name is Labona Islam, and I work in the exter External Affairs Office at the library. Um, so yeah, welcome. Our first guest is Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya, whose explosive debut fiction collection, Friday Black, places characters in surreal yet familiar positions of oppression within our criminal justice, consumerist, and pop cultural institutions. The New York Times calls his work a powerful and important and strange and beautiful collection of stories meant to be read right now. Our second guest is Daniel Torde, who I also know as my former professor who forced me to take a poetry writing class during my senior year of college while I was writing a thesis in order to complete my creative writing minor. A push which, all right, I'm like pretty grateful for now. <laughs> Torde's previous novel, The Last Flight of Hoxwell West, and his debut novella, The Sensualist, both won the National Jewish Book Award. He's currently the director of creative writing at Bryn Mawr College. Go Bryn Mawr. The Philadelphia Inquirer praises Torday's new novel, describing it as artfully written and well worth reading. Boomer One pits an angry, desperate 30-something with no job prospects against his baby boomer mother, his successful punk bassist ex-girlfriend, and the baby boomer generation as a whole. So please join me in welcoming our first guest, Nana Kwame Ajay Brenya, to the stage. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be doing an event in the library. What's strange is this is the first time I'm doing one, and um, I was pretty much born in libraries. My parents are both Ghanaian immigrants. They're the kind that drop you off at the library and pick you up at to be decided. <laughs> and so um, I feel very comfortable here. I'm like thinking, trying to find a place to sleep, you know, thinking about it. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I pretty much grew up in the library. Um, so yeah, this is my first book, and. I've been going around and it's kind of, it's still pretty crazy just to even have it out in the world. And I get asked a lot about uh, writing like sort of political stories. You know what, you know, how do you, why is it that you write these political stories? And my, you know, lately I've been like, what would you prefer me to write? What would be better? Um, for me, I feel sort of like uh, if the house is on fire, I'm not going to write about what's in the fridge, you know? Um, so, but uh, even more specifically, I was in college when Trayvon Martin was murdered. And I think like a lot of people my age, that sort of marked a shift in my consciousness. I, I started, I think, looking at the world a little bit more acutely and differently. I even, you know, went so far as to create these like pamphlets. Me and a close friend of mine, we made these pamphlets. We printed out like 500 copies and um, we scattered them around the campus. We, like, at like four in the morning, we like sort of snuck out and like, it was an anonymous pamphlet and just like put them wherever we could. And you know, I went to sleep thinking, like, you know what, we did it, you know, fixed racism. You know, I went to bed, <laughs> like, you know, feeling really happy, proud of myself. Uh, and that morning, maybe unsurprisingly, uh, nothing happened. You know, I, I thought there was gonna be like upheaval and uh, some big conversation. And you know, I woke up and I actually, I woke up pretty early to see like what was going on, to see my, the revolution I'd like ushered in. And I actually saw a janitor just like throwing them out, you know. <laughs> We had pretty much just littered. And I remember thinking like, I don't really like that. You know, I don't like that feeling. And I think for me, uh, if I've ever had a breakthrough, it came in sort of writing a story that I felt I really want to exist in the world, even if like my name wasn't attached. And now I kind of search for that feeling. I kind of look for that feeling that like maybe this story could do something. Maybe it could uh, make some difference. Maybe it won't be something that the janitor throws out at 8 a.m. when they're on the campus, you know? And um, the first story in the book is like, is like maybe the one that I first felt that feeling with. So I thought maybe I'd start there. I think I'll do a little sampler, kind of like chilies, you know? You get some mozzarella sticks, some pot stickers, <laughs> some whatever else. <laughs> Give you a small little, you know, sampler of um, this book. The first story is called The Finkelstein Five. Fila, the headless girl, walked toward Emmanuel, her neck jagged with red savagery. She was silent, but he could feel her waiting for him to do something, anything. Then his phone rang and he woke up. He took a deep breath and set the blackness in his voice down to a 1.5 on a 10-point scale. Hi there, how are you doing today? Yes, yes, I did recently inquire about the status of my application. Well, all right, 
Okay, great to hear. I'll be there. Have a spectacular day. Emmanuel rolled out of bed and brushed his teeth. The house was quiet. His parents had already left for work. That morning, like every morning, the first decision he made regarded his blackness. His skin was a deep, constant brown. In public, when people could actually see him, it was impossible to get his blackness down anywhere near 1.5. If he wore a tie, wingtip shoes, smiled constantly, used his indoor voice, and kept his hands strapped and calm at his sides, he could get his blackness as low as 4.0. Though Emmanuel was happy about scoring the interview, he also felt guilty about feeling happy about anything. Most people he knew were still mourning the Finkelstein verdict. After 28 minutes of deliberation, a jury of his peers had acquitted George Wilson Dunn of any wrongdoing whatsoever. He had been indicted for allegedly using a chainsaw to hack off the heads of five black children outside the Finkelstein Library in Valley Ridge, South Carolina. The court had ruled that because the children were basically loitering or were not actually inside the library reading, as one might expect of productive members of society, it was reasonable that Dunn had felt threatened by these five black young people. And thus, he was well within his rights when he protected himself, his library loan DVDs, and his children by going to the back of his Ford F-150 and retrieving his Hawtech Pro 18-inch 48cc chainsaw. The case had seized the country by ear and heart and was still, mostly, the only thing anyone was talking about. Finkelstein became the news cycle. On one side of the broadcast world, anchors openly wept for the children, who were saints in their eyes. On the opposite side were personalities like Brent Colgan, the ever gruff and opinionated host of What's the Big Deal? Who had said during an online panel discussion, yes, yes, they were kids, but also fuck niggers. Most news outlets fell somewhere in between. On verdict day, Emmanuel's friends and fa family and friends of many different races and backgrounds had gathered together and watched the television tuned to a station that had sympathized with the children who were popularly known as the Finkelstein Five. Pizza and drinks were served. When the ruling was announced, Emmanuel felt a clicking and grinding in his chest. It burned. His mother, known to be one of the liveliest and happiest women in the neighborhood, threw a plastic cup filled with Coke across the room. When the plastic fell and the soda splattered, the people stared at Emmanuel's mother. Seeing Miss John that way meant it was real. They lost. Emmanuel's father walked away from the group, wiping his eyes, and Emmanuel felt the grinding in his chest settle to a cold nothingness. On the ride home, his father cursed. His mother punched honks out of the steering wheel. Emmanuel breathed in and watched his hands appear, then disappear, then appear, then disappear as they rode past street lights. He let the nothing he was feeling wash over him in one cold wave after another. But now that he'd been called in for the interview at Stitches, a store self-described as an innovator with a classic sensibility that specialized in vintage sweaters, Emmanuel had something to think about besides the bodies of those kids severed at the neck, growing damp and thick, pulsing, shooting blood. Instead, he thought about what to wear. In a vague move of solidarity, Emmanuel climbed into loose-fitting cargos he'd worn on a camping trip. Then he stepped into his patent leather space jams with the laces still clean and taut as they weaved up all across the black tongue. Next, he pulled out a long ago abandoned black hoodie and dove into its tunnel. As a final act of solidarity, Emmanuel put on a gray snapback cap, a hat similar to the ones two of the Finkelstein Five had been wearing the day they were murdered, a fact George Wilson Dunn's defense had stressed throughout the proceedings. Emmanuel stepped out into the world. His blackness had a solid 7.6. He felt like evil Knievel at the top of a ramp. At the mall, he looked for something to wear to the interview, something to bring him down to at least a 4.2. He pulled the brim of his hat forward and down to shade his eyes. He walked up a hill toward Canifer Road, where he'd catch a bus. He listened to the gravel scraping under his sneakers. It had been a very long time since he'd had his blackness even close to 7.0. 
I want you safe. You got to know how to move, his father had said to him at a very young age. Emmanuel started learning the basics of his blackness before he knew how to do long division. Smiling when angry, whispering when he wanted to yell. Back when he was in middle school, um, back when he was in middle school, after a trip to the zoo where he'd been accused of stealing a stuffed panda from a gift shop, Emmanuel had burned his last pair of baggy jeans in his driveway. He'd watched the denim curl and ash in front of him with unblinking eyes. When his father came outside, Emmanuel imagined he'd get a good talking to. Instead, his father stood quietly beside him. This is an important thing to learn, he said. Together, they watched the fire until it ate itself dead. That's that first story. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I got to shout out Syracuse. I see a lot of Q smart people here. Gang, gang, squad. Um, I, I, went to, I got an MFA at Syracuse University, uh, and I went there straight out of college. I was really young, maybe too young. And uh, I had never been around writers before. And, uh, you know, I had never been around that much, uh, I don't know, like hummus before. <laughs> 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 never, <laughs> never seen so many people with, um, you know, record players and stuff. Um, prominently, prominently displayed typewriters. You know, it's like, what's going on here? Um, but it was really nice for me. I felt really welcomed there, and I really am grateful to you. Um, literally, all the people here right now actually we went to Syracuse. I look up to you guys. Um, you guys put set the bar really, really high for me. And I, you know, even now I'm still like kind of like trying to reach it. So um, as I was reading the last one, I was trying to think of a way to purposefully segue that into this next story, but I, I couldn't think of one. So um, <laughs> this next story is the titular story. I heard that word at a conference and it sounded smart, so now I try to weave it in a lot. <laughs> titular. <laughs> that means the title story. <laughs> like you could just say that. It's a whole word, like unnecessary. <laughs> This is the titular story. Um, it's called Friday Black, um, as is the book, because like I said. Um, and uh, it takes place in the mall on Black Friday. I've worked several Black Fridays. If any of you have worked in retail, I'm very sorry. And I am here in solidarity with you. Um, but yeah, like I said, it takes place on Black Friday. And, I th and I'll, I'll read just the beginning of it, because like I said, this is like maybe the mozzarella sticks of the platter. And um, um, yeah, I'll just read this at the beginning. And I think maybe I understated actually what Black Friday really is. <clears throat> Get to your sections, Angela screams. Ravenous humans howl. Our gate whines and rattles as they shake and pull their grubby fingers like worms through the grating. I sit atop a tiny cabin roof made of hard plastic. My legs hang near the windows and fleeces hang inside of it. I hold my reach, an eight foot long metal pole with a small plastic mouth at the end for grabbing hangers off the highest racks. I also use my reach to smack down Friday heads. It's my fourth Black Friday. On my first, a man from Connecticut bit a hole into my tricep, his slobber hot. I left the sales floor for 10 minutes so they could patch me up. Now I have a jagged smile on my left arm, a sickle Half circle, my lucky Friday scar. I hear Richard's shoes flopping toward me. You ready, big guy? He asks. I open one eye and look at him. I've never not been ready, so I don't say anything and close my eyes again. I get it, I get it. I have the tiger, I like it, Richard says. I nod slowly. He's nervous. He's a district manager, and this is the prominent mall. We're the biggest store in his territory. We're supposed to do a million of the next 30 days. Most of it's on me. The main gate creaks and, go and groans. I saw the super shell in the back. What'd she wear? Medium or large? Large, I say, opening both eyes. There's a contest. Whoever has the most sales gets to take home any coat in the store. 
When Richard asked me what I was going to do if I won, I told him that when I won, I was going to get, give one of the Supershell Parkers to my mother. Richard frowned but said that was honorable. I said, yeah, it was. The super shells are the most expensive coats we have this season. Down filled lofted exterior with a water repellent finish, zip vents to keep the thing breathable, elastic hem plus faux fur on the hood for a luxurious touch. I know Richard would have me choose literally anything else. That's half of why I chose it. I set it aside in the back. It's the only large we've got due to a shipment glitch. Nobody will touch it because I'm me. Most of the Friday heads are here for the pole face stuff. And whose name is lined up with the pole face section on the daily breakdown each day this weekend? It's not Lance or Michelle, that's for sure. It's not the new kid duo either. I look across the denim where duo is pacing back and forth, making sure his piles are neat and folded. He's a pretty good kid. Sometimes he'll actually ask to help with shipment. He wears a t-shirt and skinny jeans like most of the customers his age. Angela tells him to watch me, to learn from me. She says he's my heir apparent. I like him, but he's not like me. He can sound honest. He knows how to see what people want, but he can't do what I can. Now I'm Black Friday, but he'll survive denim. Michelle and Lance cover shoes and graphic tees. Michelle and Lance might as well be anybody else. Lance is working the broom. There's a grind and a metallic rumble. Angela's in the front. She's pushed the button and turned the key. The main gate eats itself as it rolls into the ceiling. Get out of here, I yell to Richard. He runs to the register while he'll be back up to the back up, safe. Maybe 80 people rush to the gate, clawing and stampeding, pushing racks and bodies aside. Have you ever seen people run from a fire or gunshots? It's like that with less fear and more hunger. From my cabin, I see a child, a girl maybe six years old, disappear as the wave of consumer fervor swallows her up. She sprawled face down with dirty shoe prints on her pink coat. Lance walks up to the small pink body. He's pulling a pallet jack and holding a huge push broom. He thrusts the broom head into her side and tries to sweep her onto the pallet jack so he can roll her to the section we've designated for bodies. As he touches her, a woman wearing a gray scarf pushes him away and yanks the girl to her feet. I imagine the mother explaining that her tiny daughter isn't dead yet. She pulls the little girl toward me. The girl limps and tries to keep up, and then I have to forget about them. Blue sun sleek puck. A man with wild eyes and a bubble fest screams as he grabs my left ankle. White foam drips from his mouth. I use my right foot to stomp his hand and I feel his fingers crush beneath my boots. He howls, sleek puck, son, while licking his injured hand. I look him in the eyes, deep red around the lids, red at the corners. I understand him perfectly. What he's saying is this, my son, Loves me most on Christmas. I have him holidays. Me and him. Once the one thing, only thing, his mother won't on me need to feel like father. Ever since the first time, since the bite, I can speak Black Friday. Or I can understand it at least. Not fluently, but well enough. I have some of them in me. I hear the people, the sizes, the model, the make, and the reason. Even if all they're doing is foaming at the mouth. I use my reach and pull a medium-sized blue sleek pack pole face from a face-out rack way up on the wall. Thanks, he growls when I throw the jacket in his face. So that's the beginning of that story. Thank you. Once you start the clapping precedent, you have to keep it up, you know. <laughs> um, and this, I'll, write, I'll read this very, very short um, story, the um, short story in the book. Um, it's called Things My Mother Said. And you know, again, growing up with parents who are um, not from where you're from, often you, you're frustrated because you don't really always understand exactly what they mean. Um, even, and then it took me like growing up to sort of kind of actually realize they were saying the things I wanted them to say, just maybe not in ways I could always understand it. Um, and yeah, and we've kind of grown a lot. And I've also, I've been saying this as I go around, um, I finally figured out how to get your you know, very immigrant parents to approve of your sort of artistic career. And all I needed to do was get a profile in the New York Times, and all of a sudden, it was fine. <laughs> Nana is an artist. <laughs> That's my dad. He's an artist, and you know, I'm like, that sounds different than 
the rest of my life. <laughs> um, this story is called um, Things My Mother Said. My mother's favorite thing to say to me was, I am not your friend. She'd often say, you are my firstborn son, my only son, as a reminder not to die. She loved saying as a way to keep me humble, I didn't have a mother. You're lucky. You have a mother. When the TV went dark, my mother said, good. Now you can read more. Then our house at the bottom of a hill lost all its life, gas, water, electric. One day I came home to the warm smell of chicken and rice. I hadn't been able to steal a second burger in the cafeteria at school that day. My stomach whined. At home, the fridge had become a casket bearing nothing. The range and oven had become decorations meant to make a dying box look like a home. Hunger covered those days. Where is this from? I asked, already carving a healthy portion from a worn gray pot. My mother pretended she didn't hear me. She was studying the pages of her massive white Bible at the kitchen table. Wide sheets of light pressed through the window and draped her. She spent her days reading that big Bible. Its pages wore to film as her fingers fluttered from psalm to psalm. She'd be asleep by the splash of dusk. I, on the other hand, would be up for hours trying to do homework by the blue glow of my cell phone, clinging to its light until it died. At night, hunger and I huddled together. I'd fall asleep thinking one day I would change everything. That afternoon, I ate the chicken and rice. It tasted like pepper and smoke. How did you make this, Mom? I asked again. She looked up from her Bible. How about you? Did you pray over your food? Did you say your psalms today? I ate the food quickly, greedily. I chewed the bones till they splintered in my mouth. Another thing my mother often said, you are the best thing that ever happened to me. Later, when I was in the backyard, hesitant to return to the dying box as the sun dipped away, I found a patch of charred grass and a small circle of blackened stones and pebbles, an ash moon branded into a sea of wild green grass. I touched a gray rock partially blackened by flame to see if it was still hot. I felt proud and ashamed. For the record, I know I was lucky. I know I'm lucky. I don't think you're stupid. I know I'm not your friend. I hope you can be proud of me. Thank you, guys. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to follow that. Uh, Nana, that was awesome. Uh, I, uh, I went to Syracuse to get an MFA just like Nana and a couple years ago went back there to read for my first book and uh, and I, I met Nana and a couple of his friends and, and um, sometimes you can just tell from, from someone's spirit that, they, that they're going to just do all the good stuff and it's been really fun to watch just what a huge success this book has been. Uh, I was thinking of all these things I wanted to say about Nana while I was getting up here and then I realized that we're going to be sitting there talking for like a half an hour afterwards so I'm not going to say any of them. Anyway, I'm going to be reading from this book called uh, called Boomer One. Um, it is about a guy named uh, Mark Brumfeld. He's, uh, he's 30 years old, he loses a job in New York City and is forced to move back to his parents' basement in Baltimore and while he's there he, uh, he starts a violent revolution or attempts to start a violent revolution of millennials forcing baby boomers to retire from their jobs so that the millennials can have them. Uh, there are three characters. The, the book also, that description probably does not make clear that the book also is a retelling, a loose retelling of, uh, of Julius Caesar. Uh, so the Mark Brumfeld character is, is, Mark, is, uh, is, is Mark Brutus and the Cassie character who's his girlfriend who's a punk bassist in her 20s is, is Cassius um, and their attempt to start this revolution ends up being uh, a kind of assassination of Mark's mother, Julia, um, who is very sad that her, her son ends up committing a terrorist act. Uh, so that, that all sounds fun, right? You guys doing good out there? Uh, it's really nice to be at a hometown crowd. I've been running around a lot, so it's awfully fun to see loved one and neighbors and friends and Syracuse alum. Uh, so I'm going to read just a little bit. I'm not going to take up too much of your time, but I want to read a little bit from Mark, a little bit from Cassie, and a little bit from Julia, and then uh, Nana and I can um, make jokes together. So uh, so first up is Mark. Uh, this I'm going to read to you. Why am I not able to find the page on which this happened? Anybody know what page I'm about to read from? 
Somebody shout out a number. Okay, so uh, so this is actually Mark comes home. Uh, he gets he he starts playing basketball at the JCC where he played as a kid in Baltimore, and he gets into a fist fight with his eighth grade teacher, um, and then uh, and then he comes back and sits down in front of his computer uh, and gives his first what he calls them boomer missives, um, and in this case he renames himself Isaac Abramson, Isaac son of Abraham, sacrificed. I Isaac Abramson am a failure an abject, complete, massive, total failure. I graduated from a very good liberal arts college with a degree in English. I graduated cum laude. No one told me how little it would matter. The day I walked on stage to be handed a diploma, September 11th hadn't happened yet. No one would even have imagined that it could happen. The tech boom was still a boom boom. I did the things I was supposed to do. I wrote good papers. I drank first bad beer, then good beer, then bourbon, then scotch. I watched the kids who graduated before me as they left for San Francisco and made good money in internet startups. Bought homes in Palo Alto on the Russian River in Sausalito. I watched all of that go away. I didn't want any of that anyway. I wasn't ever going to be on the ground floor of Google or Yahoo. I never thought Ask Jeeves was all that bad a website. Jeeves gave, I took. I had a MySpace account, wrote Friendster, testimonials. I never once chatted on a chat room. I didn't know what the I and M and I M stood for. That was fine for me. I wasn't greedy. I didn't want a new economy job. I wanted an old economy job. I wanted a job. I wasn't a failure at first. I went to New York City where I got a decent job. I lived there for 10 years, one decade, and I never once lived in an apartment alone. I had that job and the magazines went into the ground. Old media started to die. They didn't publish words anymore. They created content instead of publishing journalism or essays. So I went back to grad school. It was like a job. I read books and prepared to be an educator. Then I finished, then there were no jobs. Then I accrued debt and I could no longer afford to live on my own. Now I'm back in my parents' basement. Do you know who had all the jobs? Baby boomers. 70-year-olds still had the jobs. I tried to get a job, but I could not. I tried and tried, then my money ran out. I could not find a job. This spring, I moved back into my parents' house. They gave me the room I grew up in, the basement room. My father is 69 years old, and he has not yet retired from his job. It will disappear so that his hospital can pay for benefits, so that its employees can pay for taxes. My mother is 68 years old, and she is again a stay-at-home mom today. Only now I'm who she stays at home with. Again, I am infantilized. Now, I want you to do one more thing. If you have no job, I want you to look at the basement where you live right now. Is it a basement like my basement? Does it make you happy, this basement? Does it smell musty? Does it contain the same couch on which you kissed your first girl when you were in eighth grade? But that's not who I want to talk to right now. Instead, if you do have a job, I want to talk to you. I want you to do something different. If you do have a job, I want you to pull out your latest pay stub or pull it up online. Do you see the line that says social security tax? I want you to see how much money you pay every month so the baby boomers can live off social security. And I want you to know one thing. You will never see a cent of that money. You will never receive social security. You will never have a retirement. You will never have your parents' jobs because those jobs will not exist. And you are paying not for you, but for them. You're not paying so that when you're 65, you'll receive social security in the form of money. You're paying for them now. You're paying so that they will be able to live well now, now that they're retired. But they are old, and you are young, and this is America, land of the young and home of the young. And when the system is broken, you fix the system. We're ugly, but we have the music. Think about all that till my next missive. Think about how this might look if it were different. Think this, social insecurity. Resist much, obey little, propaganda by the deed, boom, boom. So that's Mark. Uh, oh, no. So now we're, now we're going to clap in between, too. Cool. There's going to be so much applause. Uh, so Mark gives a bunch of those missives. I wrote probably like 10 of them. I think there's like three that ended up in the book. Um, they needed to be convincingly like something that might lead some people into a revolution. So if anybody feels like shooting anything right now, please don't. Just don't shoot things in life ever. Uh, Cassie, uh, Mark's girlfriend, is in her early 20s. She's a punk bassist. Um, and she ends up actually succeeding in magazines where he doesn't. Um, she ends up doing really well in a, a fact-checking job. She does so well that she ends up... Um, getting these jobs uh, editing video. And video, uh, you guys have seen videos on the internet? 
remember how you, you used to not be able to do that at one point. Um, video has become like much more lucrative, and so she gets this job working for something called Native Content. Uh, Native Content is basically like paid advertorials. Um, so she she does so well that she, she starts getting paid very well in New York, and then she gets a job working out in San Francisco, which is now the most expensive place in the country to live. I think it's like $4,800 for a two bedroom or something. Uh, don't move there. Stay in Philly. So anyway, so, uh, so she throws all of her remaining stuff in the back of a, of a U-Haul um, and drives cross country. Um, and for the first time basically in her life, she turns off her phone and just puts it on um, airplane mode for the three days that she's driving cross country while Mark is involved in this act of domestic terrorism. So I'm gonna read a little bit from as she's driving across the country. The second moment that would stick forever in Cassie's mind occurred in Colorado. She'd been on the road for two days of long cross Indiana, cross Missouri, cross Kansas, driving, when the Colorado border came into view. She'd seen on her road atlas, she didn't use Google Maps, unplugged, it was all going to be unplugged, and there wasn't a USB cable in the U-Haul anyway. That there was an la immense lake in the unironically named Canarado, right on the Kansas-Colorado border. It'd be a little before noon when she hit the crossing, still in the low 70s now in mid-fall, and she figured she'd dip in a toe as she gazed west at the Rockies. But the lake was room temperature and furry with algae all the way to the water's bottom. And before her lay, and before her lay the manifest destiny of AutoCAD flat land as far as the eye could see, not only to the west but in every direction. She got back into the truck and found that the entire eastern third of Colorado was more Kansas than it was Montana. Flat, 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 Kansan land all the way to Denver. To her surprise, Cassie had found herself listening to talk radio more than music on the ride cross country. But now she put on Nirvana and blasted territorial pissings at 38 out of 40 in the volume on the dashboard. So it was amid boredom and disappointment compounded by Chris Novoselic's off-tune sardonic blaring of Come On People Now followed by Kurt Cobain's distorted Fender Jaguar chords, blurt, blurt, blurting that 20 miles west, pre-rush hour traffic in Denver, with the sun moving toward her line of sight and pink beginning to bleed cut stake blood across the far horizon, suddenly Cassie found herself driving through the first staggering outcroppings of Rockies. She reached for the stereo and turned off the music. Outside of Boulder, I-70 cut through convex jagged cliffs looming down onto the highway. Cassie could feel her breath catch in her throat. She rolled down her window and tried to look up, but no matter what angle she looked from, she couldn't see the tops only every quarter mile or so, getting a respite from the sun that glinted phosphorus white through a break in the cliffs. It was like nothing she'd ever seen, felt like nothing she'd ever felt, the sheer physical mass of it kept taking her breath from her. And she was at 10,000 feet climbing switchbacks to drive over Independence Pass over the Continental Divide before Cassie realized that something new was in her head, crawling up her back, absent from the buzz in her forearms. She wasn't thinking about Mark. She wasn't thinking about her ex-girlfriend. She wasn't thinking about videos or the computer in her pocket. She wasn't thinking about anything. It made her wish she had a quarter of purple kush that she had 17 beers and a guitar in her hands until she realized that it made her happy to have none of those things. She was at peace in a truck with no music on at all. Time was moving forward and moving through it in a kind of eternal present. Even the instinct to click on one of Adobe Premiere's gray boxes and edit slash cut Manipulate to tell a story through video was gone. Images were gone. Sound and melody and harmony disappeared. Words were gone. Here she was, Cassie Black, alone in a U-Haul, free from love, free from sound, free from envelopment, free from her past, flying clear west toward the bright, open future. She stopped at a pull-off just as she hit the most dramatic heights of Independence Pass. The air was rarefied and icy in her nostrils and cold rang out in her ears, and as she looked back east, all she could see for miles were bright open valleys amid the Rockies. Even the instinct to take a selfie fled her as she realized that her phone wasn't in her pocket. She didn't even fucking know where the phone was, and if she did, if she did have it, her instinct now would be to take video and not a photo, and there wasn't a thing to capture here. It was impossible to imagine that the flatness on the other side of Denver all that Kansas spreading east all the way to St. Louis existed at all. She drank deep inside herself. All at once she was a toddler again. Fuck executive function. Fuck object permanence. If you showed her a penny then and put it in your pocket, Cassie would assume it was lost to this world for all eternity and she did not care. What she couldn't see didn't exist. All she wanted was just to breathe this air alone. So that's Cassie. Uh, 
There's like a little bit of um, work that I guess you have to do to do three voices in a book. So, um, so those Cassie paragraphs, I don't know if you can tell, are a little denser. Um, Julia was sort of my first uh, opportunity. Hopefully Nana and I will get a little chance to talk about this afterwards, but um, I feel like there's like the writing that you want to do and then there's the writing that you can do. Um, and when I was an undergrad, I was like super into high modernism and really loved Faulkner and really loved Joyce and, uh, and I never felt like I could do it. Uh, and so I think Mark's voice sort of more reflects that, but, um, but Julia is like these huge dense paragraphs and, um, she's stuck at home. She, she's been forced to sell a bunch of instruments after, um, having been like, she's basically based on Emily Harris. She was, she was essentially like a, um, somewhat successful musician for a period and then is, and was forced to stop playing, um, when she suffered from hearing loss. Uh, so I'll give you just a little sense of her voice, and then I'm going to walk over there and sit down. Do you care which chair you're in? Okay, I'm just going to stand in between the two. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit, and hopefully you guys will have some questions for us. Oh, and Julia is from Philadelphia, so there may be Philadelphia references. Julia did not remember at the time how light looked filtering slowly into that kitchen on East Cedric Street, east of Germantown Avenue. Though when she tried to think of how that kitchen looked, she realized most memories were not of the kitchen itself, but of a picture she'd seen of the kitchen in her later years. She didn't know now how much of this was how her mind worked and how much of it was simply how the mind worked. There were memories of events, events both traumatic and mundane, meaningful or seemingly without meaning. And then there was the recounting of those events, the keepsakes we looked at again and again, which became their own memory. She knew that she did not suffer from what the new generation seemed at every turn to want to call PTSD. PTSD suggested to her that trauma was singular and finite, an event that took place like the snapping of a picture then ended. There was nothing post about what she was suffering. There was no single event that had transpired then ended. It occurred to Julia almost daily that PTSD must be the most egregiously mis- and overused medical term in the history of American pop culture. There were soldiers in VA hospitals all over the country who actually suffered from it. Most likely her own father suffered from it, coming back from World War II, something very much like it anyway, before the term was coined. But she herself suffered and suffered for something that was neither post nor trauma, not finite nor ended. She suffered from an eternal and eternally recurring present. She suffered when she cleaned out her basement in advance of her son moving back in. She suffered by the smells of the Luthier and Owings Mills where she bought her favorite fiddle to get set up filled her nose. She suffered in the months after when her son was arrested and she couldn't bring herself to leave the house to do anything other than shop for groceries, an activity during which she suffered even more. She recognized that perhaps the greatest misunderstanding her son's generation had of the world was the misguided belief that an event transpired and then ended in an ineradicable clean way, like a television show or a YouTube clip that began when called forth by pressing right pointing isosceles triangles. It could be skipped by that triangle paired, replayed by a click on an arrow manipulated into a spiral, moved in a direction left or right, to the left, back in time, to the right, forward. This belief wasn't religious, but it was a belief system like any other, and perhaps more erroneous than most. Had any generation in the history of the world been so duped about the nature of time, been rendered so complacent by the appearance of control over perception, facts so easily undermined, that an event could take place in the time it took to be viewed as a video. That the reproduction of that event could be recounted in the same span that it took for an event to take place. Julia knew that time was not finite in such a way that it wasn't finite at all. There were no beginnings and endings and then retrospective suffering. There was time experienced in a single eternal present of being, being, being. Julia didn't know what memory was or why images flashed at her amid this eternal present, but she knew those images themselves were not finished. They existed in her mind and persisted, neither to be overcome nor to be forgotten. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. Who, do you, who do you read when you're stuck? When you're trying to write and you're stuck, who do you read? Um, I'm always pretty stuck, so I have to be reading somebody all the time, but if I am, like, <laughs> I, I guess, exceptionally stuck. Um, now I try to, not right now, right now I'm running around and not doing anything. But, um, <laughs> Now I try to actually like read poetry. You know, it depends on who, who it might be. I have um, Marcus Wicker's Silencer. I, um, and so I've been trying to do that, actually, when I can. Um, but I'm not just saying that because you're a poet, either. <laughs> That's one of the people I was talking about. Kate, I love you guys. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I have a really bad cold, and I took a bunch of Alka Seltzer before this. So if I'm hallucinating you, can you let me know? No, I, I, feel, <laughs> I feel like I'm probably here, but but I'm good. Uh, I feel like the poetry answer is a good one. Um, I really I like, use that, so you can't use that. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, please. Um, <laughs> so uh, and I, I love like um, Louise Glick and Dennis Johnson, who are both like very kind of like narrative, but also confessional poets. Um, I feel like they. Like, I feel like the hard thing is like, if you're stuck is sometimes you like get a little stilted and kind of want to like toy with stuff. And then other times like there's this kind of like Philip Roth desire to just like spew that actually can be like just as bad. And it's nice to read poets who like, you can tell they could write paragraphs if they wanted to, but the lines are what stop them. And I feel like reading those poets in particular kind of do that for me. Next question. All right, I'll, I, I'll throw one out there. Do it, do it, do it. Um, I'll, this one will be for Dan. Nice. So this is not your first visit to the free library, but this book is very much a departure from your last work. I wonder if you would talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so for what it's worth, if any of you have, sorry, I assume all of you have not read any of my other work. Uh, my, my, uh, my, first, my, my first full-length book uh, was about a Royal Air Force pilot. It took like eight years to research, and it wasn't historical fiction, but it had a bunch of homework in it. Um, and it's funny, I, uh, I don't know if it's funny, but when I think about sort of the moment where I was ready to move on, um, I was on a stage like not on like this one, uh, I got lucky that book won an award that like a bunch of people came out for and um, my editor was there for it and I found myself on stage saying to a question like this, I feel like my sort of like dream model is Bob Dylan who not only was like constantly inventing something new but also going back and reinventing everything that came before it. So I think I felt like for this one, I just had to take a big break um, and, and just do something that was like much more an act of imagination and that didn't feel like quite so much just like pushing all that homework in. I didn't want to do the homework for Poxel that I did. I, I wrote like 200 pages of that book and realized I just didn't know enough and had to take a couple more trips to Eastern Europe than I wanted to. And um, yeah, so like the next thing I'm working on now is also totally different. Um, you know, I think it's weirdly kind of a publisher's nightmare to do that because there is this sense that they like want you to find an audience and then keep that audience. Mm -hmm. um, and it helps if people are like, oh, this sounds like David Sedaris and this also like David Sedaris. Uh, I love David Sedaris. I mean, I, I, I think I'm expressing some jealousy of a person who can kind of do that. But for me, like, I feel like I just have to kind of um, find the language that fits the, the, the content. And there, I mean, I guess I would just say on some level, and this is getting long-winded, but but that requires finding new language for each book, right? I mean, if the con unless, unless I'm gonna write about the same thing over and over again, I have to wait until I figure out what I'm writing about and then figure out what kind of language it, it requires. Nana, I've got one for you too. Roxanne Gay gave you a really nice review in the New York Times that ends with, read this book. <laughs> and obviously, many people are, as it's a bestseller. I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about that, what it's like to bring your book into the world and what this experience has been like for you. Um, it has been, I mean, it's been a lot of different things. People ask me like that a lot, like how's it feel? It's kind of like, like which part, you know? Um, some parts are kind of awkward. Like I, I think i um, way too awkward to be having my picture taken as much as they're doing that. That's like weird for me. Um, some parts are really humbling. Cause like people like that are, you know, people much smarter than you will review your book. And, um, you know, I, someone wrote, um, you know, Nana has a, like, like bravo, I think was the word. And my first instinct was like, your mom has bravo, you know? <laughs> then I <laughs> look it up and I say, I'm sorry, actually, thank you very much. I appreciate that. That's my bad. Um, it has been overwhelming. It's very different from, you know, my previous publication experience. There's like a comic book that perfectly explains my, my experience was it was a, a comic strip. It's three panels. The first panel is a guy's coming to an office like to a publisher will you publish my stories? The second panel is a publisher saying no. And the third panel is the end, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was what my publishing experience had been pretty much before this. And then, um, you know, but then one yes, a lot of things change. So it has been overwhelming. It's been very nice. There's been a lot of the kindness of like, you know, the writers that I, that I know and the people that are interested in the book is, it sort of surprises me and kind of shocks me every time I go somewhere. Um, it has been, it's so much, and it's in the, I'm in the middle of it now. The book has only came out the 23rd, you know? So it's, uh, it's been um, a roller coaster, to use that cliche, and, but I'm, I'm trying to have fun with it too. But, um, you know, it's a lot. Can I ask you a follow-up on that? Yeah. Um, so 
and and I I don't want to like thumb this scale at all, but um, but I really love the book, and I really Thank love you. the just like the both the loudness and the quietness of moving from story to story. And I know for me, having written a book now that like is an act of the imagination, when I first started getting reviews in, they called it satirical. I got like really anxious because I was just like, I don't think, I was, I like literally had to go to the, like I've had this experience in the last like 10 years of being like having to go to the dictionary and be like, wait, what does racism mean? What does anti-Semitism yeah, yeah. mean? Like what does fascism mean? And like I had to like literally go to the dictionary and be like, do I know what, sati what, what satire means? Because I don't think I intended to write a satire. Right. And I had that experience a lot. So and Nana and I both studied with this writer, George Saunders, who was a big influence on both of us as like people and writers. But um, like when I've, I, when I've heard people call his writing satire, I often I'm just like, I don't think so. I think it's just like really loud um, humans. Um, so like, what's been your experience of of having your stories called? Because I think like, especially like Finkelstein Five and Black Friday and Zimmerman Land, like are they're a little louder than some of what I tried to do here, but they're still like pretty well in the realm of a thing that could happen or has happened. So like, what just I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna actually gonna ask the question at some point. No, I, are they are they satirical? Like, what's your sense of that? I um I I don't think I go into them thinking that you know I, like I, I I don't go in thinking like this will be a story about this topic or issue or person or any of that stuff. You know, um, from story to story, I sort of like do whatever I. I the story needs, you know, and try to let the story sort of tell me what it should be. I mean, the, the, that said, there are stories that are pretty end up being pretty pointedly considering racism, for example. Right. Uh, like, but like, but but even that is like for me, it's like, you know, racism is like a big concept. It's about this particular character going through the world in a world that happens to be racist, which is ours, you know, and um, maybe the way that racism manifests is hyper like like hyperbolic, which makes it feel like I'm being satirical. But I, you know, I don't know. I, I just kind of let the people that are smarter than me just call, say what they want to say, <laughs> you know. Really, I um, same thing with like the genre stuff, you know. If it's sci-fi, if it's dystopic, if it's whatever, or I guess satire, surreal, whatever, you know. I, I I'm saying sure, yeah, you know. Um, I don't think about that per se. I kind of just, but I, I I'm really interested in like doing whatever I want, and then the label, you know, go ahead. Yeah, and maybe that's actually the question I'm asking is like, does that end up constricting? Like, I like I want to think for myself also about like, can that constrict you? That that then there's an expectation that the next thing is satirical or in that realm. Yeah, I mean, I I think that if I think about it, there will be. So I like try to continue to not think about it. You know, <laughs> I would try uh, the question. <laughs> I would try my best, but I mean, uh, and there's so many ways. I, I mean, I'm way deep into the next thing I'm gonna do, which kind of connects to a question I think I have for you, but um. I think if I did think about am I what's this or that or this genre, you know, I, you know, those are, to me those aren't very me sorry those aren't very meaningful lighthouses. Um, for me, it's like is it engaging? Are these characters feel alive? Is it gonna do something, you know? And then everything else, whether it's genre or whatever, I think it's mostly just like either a selling tool or just to give you the language to talk about it that is not perfect but sometimes purposeful. You know, right. yeah, no doubt. Hi, um, it's weird. I'm 30 and my father's 69, so it's strange. <laughs> I had a question. I hacked your email a while ago. Sorry. <laughs> mm -hmm. I had a question about. Um, do you uh, do you find you gain energy from writing about uh, a failure like the boomer character, the kind of rage and resentment? it kind of gives a flowing prose? Does it create a different negative energy when you're writing it? Thank yeah, you. That, that's a good question. Um, you know, I mean, I, there's like, I feel like I have like 18 different answers for each question that I could be asked, but like the real mm -hmm. answer to like where did this book start actually was I have um, this good friend, this short story writer, Karen Russell, whose work I really love. Yeah. And um, she's one of those people who can just kind of like see straight to through you and uh, and we I was like ranting about something at lunch one day and she was just like you're a really good ranter you should probably just rant on the page and and like I just kind of lodged there and and actually then I was reading about Philip Roth and he talks about um, Alfred Portnoy's complaint he would like do this joke at dinner parties where he'd be like pretend that he was doing the voice of a um, this guy who had masturbated using liver and was going into therapy to talk about it, and, so, and somebody was like, you know, you should write that down. And he, he was like, it was like 15 pages of just writing down this joke that he would tell with friends. So I think for me, it just started from this experience of like just typing real fast. And maybe that's what I meant to the to, to Laura's question, which is, 
like whatever voices I was trying to do in Poxel or in, in, in a novella, like that wasn't going to work for this guy who was going to rant. And, um, and then I think just the emotional background to that, like the horse that was pulling that cart was, was some anger about what was going on in the world around me, and, and that's still there. Uh, and, and I think it's giving a lot of us energy right now. And the question is just like, can you channel that to something positive, like writing a novel, or you know, hopefully not doing anything seditious, or um, you know, like going out and like uh, marching, or I mean, like th I think the question in a, in, a, in a moment of like intense um, injustice is is just that question of like, how are you going to take that anger and bottle it in some way and do something with it? And then also, how are you going to be careful? Like, I think for me, why Julius Caesar was a good example was like, in act three, there's an assassination and then shit goes really bad, right? So the question is like, how can you bottle that enough that it doesn't lead you down a path that you can't come back from? Next question. I saw a few more hands on that side. <laughs> <laughs> um, do either of you keep a diary slash how much writing do you do that's like not intended for publication at all? That's just practice or something? Um, I don't keep, currently I don't really keep a diary, but I always have like a thing of like lines that strike me. Um, I have in the past though. I, I, I've done the whole like the writer's way the writer's way, three days thing, three pages thing. I've done that, and I found it actually very helpful. And maybe I should get back into that. But um, I, I don't keep a diary now, but I do like keep several notebooks slash legal pads of things that, um, things just to write. And I don't do enough writing just for me, actually, not at all. Yeah, I feel jealous of people who keep a, a journal, and I think some of it is just like, I had hair at one point. Like, I have a nine-year-old and a five-year-old, and my wife's a doctor, and I have a teaching job. And I mean, I do so much writing just uh, elsewhere in life. And I mean, I think actually, well, let me say two things. I think it's useful if you can do it, but I would also say, I feel like sometimes there can be pressure to be like, well, should I be writing more in life? And it's actually useful to realize, like, you text a lot, you write a lot of emails. I find, like, when I'm writing these, like, really long notes back to students on workshop stories, like, sometimes I'll be like, oh, I'm talking, right. I'm actually talking to me, right? I'm like, why aren't you smarter and better at this? <laughs> I mean, like, there's a way in which, like, so, sometimes there's, like, language that you'll find and you're just like, oh, right, like, that's, that's me just, like, working some shit out. And then when I get to turn back to my writing, it actually has helped a lot. Yeah. Emails. Emails. Right. Good, a good email can find its way into being like a voice, right? right? I mean, emails are my worst enemy right now, but yeah, I know what you Yeah, mean. don't. Just, delete, <laughs> just do it from, from when the book came out until like a month from now, just delete it. I know. No one write, no, not right now. Emails are rough. <laughs> uh, I had a, I had a follow-up question about this, something before, though, and because um, I, I, I read Poxel, and that was actually the first novel I taught, like full novel, and I, and I sorry, and now, no, it was great. And um, listening to this and then thinking about, I guess maybe selfishly about what I'm trying to do now, um, when you have, when you ha do have like one piece with so with pretty disparate or different voices, like how do you like sort of keep it feeling sort of um, I don't know cohesive and how and how do you work those voices to sort of like you know build each other up and enhance each other? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, I should say, so Nana uh, got to go to Syracuse when this novelist Dana Spiata has been teaching there, and she's like one of my favorite novelists. And so I guess you probably got a lot more like novel guidance than I did. But, but when I was there, you know, I was really excited to study with George Saunders and Mary Gateskill and both of them gave me a lot but I don't think either of them was like a really natural novelist. I mean yeah. Mary's a great novelist but I feel like in some ways she's more naturally a short story writer who's written novels. Um, so for me it's been much more about just like getting a big pile of, of stuff to do something with. Like I feel like stories are about this like distillation and trying to just hit it as hard as you can. Um, and there's a thing that happens for me anyway where like I'll like, I, I try not to force myself to make things continuous. Mm -hmm. Like when I, when I teach a novel class, I teach almost exclusively novels that aren't like a single 300 page narrative. Cause right. I feel like with my students, I'm just like, if you can do that, you just do that. Right, right. Like right. you don't even need to ask the question. Um, but I find myself like very often like getting a bunch of prose that doesn't feel complete and getting a bunch of other prose that doesn't feel complete and then asking like, what's the ligature that has to tie it together. So like for me with this, like I kind of thought it was just gonna be Mark. And then I was like, God, that is not likable. Or I mean, that's just like not, I mean like, like being trapped in a room with Mark for 300 pages right. would drive anybody crazy. And then I kind of had to bring Kathy in. And then I was like, well, you know, that's still not quite doing it because it's, it's still this just like, um, it's just like a screed against baby boomers. And, and I just don't know how much that's gonna do. And so I felt like, okay, maybe there needs to be this um, 
this boomer voice and what would that sound like? And I have to say, by the time I finished, like Julia became my favorite character. Right. Because she was, there, I mean, like the material was there for her to fight against. And then I had to like her so much and, and feel so much for her and give her so many of the qualities that I wanted that then that character kind of reigned the day. Right. So I mean, in a way, so you're working on a novel? Mm -hmm. How's it going? Um, pretty, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I might go back to, I mean, you know, it's, I mean, right now I'm not doing it because I'm running around and stuff. But I, I have, there's stuff there, you know. Yeah, I think you just get a lot of stuff there. That's, yeah. That's, that's my I'm almost sorry because my question is so mundane. It seems as if so, if somebody had a much no, more poignant great. question. But it has to do, well, actually, maybe it's two pronged. On one hand, is it do you write every day, either for yourselves or on your work? And I think you may have partly answered that, but I'm trying to get a clear question. And the other one, perhaps might be a little more poignant, has more to do with uh, the annoying question of social responsibility, quote, quote. Um, and how, because see, I would have, I'm very strange in the sense I would have probably liked to read a 300 page of Mark, because hmm. uh, we would have had probably a lot to say to each other, um, mm -hmm. and so, which is sad, <laughs> probably, but I just thought his voice was, there was a lot that he was saying that was really, you know, and just like Black Friday was, on one hand, you know, it's just, cons it, it's just, shopping, but there were some poignant points about consumerism. Yes. So um, on one hand, what, how, how quick is the writing? And then secondly, is what is the, the social uh, casket uh, context within which it thrives? Um, so the first answer, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, but no. In the summer, sometimes I can, get, I can be doing that. But right now, no, definitely not. Um, that is, I do not write every day right now. But for the second part, um, and again, and I, and, I, and, I, and I think about it a lot. So um, one of the professors at Syracuse, Arthur Flowers, he had this prompt, like, you know, write a story to save the world. And, um, you know, my first response to that story, to that prompt was sort of like, you know, like, eh, like, why would, you know, that's too, you can't do that. Or I don't know, being, I just had like a weird response to it, which I think was mostly pretentious, pretentiousness that I had like sort of received from like like literary world or something. Um, now that is like kind of always my prompt on some level, and I think that it's sort of arrogant to like not to think that's impossible to think that writing can't save the world. Um, and I also, you know, what I guess moreover the story I wrote to that prompt was the, that the last story I read, the thing about my mom, which it maybe is on its face like the not so pointedly political or socially responsible or something. I think. Um, just being yourself fully, honestly, earnestly, full, and like even loudly is maybe the important social work that you need to do. I think um, for me, those, the, like whether it's like the craziness of consumerism, I worked in the mall for a long time. I think it's weird that human beings trample other human beings <laughs> for TVs. <laughs> and that's like, that's something that strikes me. I don't feel comfortable with people that look like me getting murdered in the street, you know? So I, it's something that comes out of my fiction. Um, but I don't, I would never say that you have to directly do that. I think just being a person, and if you if you write like uh, fully and like and like have like your sort of unmitigated self, I think that can be the important work too. So um, I that that is, but I guess that's to say I think there is some on some level some social responsibility if you're going to make art to do something. But it might be just be the responsibility might be just to be you. Yeah, I feel, say that. I feel really glad you said that first because I was actually going to say like I feel like of the three pieces that Nana read from. You, you might knee-jerk assume that the first two are the ones that are political, but I sort of think of the third one as being the one that's political. Yeah. Um, when I was working on Poxel, which, was, which mostly takes place during the Blitz in 1940, and I was looking for all these narratives of what it sounded like when like, T.S. Eliot was describing actually being in the street and um, what a New Yorker reporter, there's a great book of the, um, the, the New Yorker talk of the town reporter who was actually in London at the time. But then I found Virginia Woolf's diaries and she was writing Miss Dalloway in the waves at the time. And there's a part of me that just feels like, you know, in a moment like this, it feels almost most important to realize like that, just like intense, like what was it like for a person to go buy flowers in the midst of what was going on? Right. Like that's the moment at which maybe that's gonna save the world. And, and I would never wanna presume to know that I know like which sentence is gonna save the world, but just that if you can present a person in the way they think that maybe that'll have a chance. Right, and I guess like, and like maybe the, uh, the other part for me is though, I do, I do think just because of the kind of work that I end up doing, I am sort of, 
um, conscious of the possibility uh, that I might could re be recreating a violence and not doing something with it, it would be bad. You know, um, Roger Reese has a talk called The Work of Art in the Age of Ferguson, Baltimore, and Charleston. He talks about how, to, like, you know, if you're going to make this violence on this page, violence in your art, then how can you also at the same time, like, un unpack that or critically dismantle, like, the system itself? And so I think about that in a lot of different ways. And I think story to story, there's a lot of different things about that. So I think maybe I have a responsibility to do that, probably, to not just make violence and say, like, cool, look what I did. Um, but I mean, but that said, I think, like, what you're saying, like, just, you know, making your, what you want to make, I think, is important. And that might be the thing to do. Writing to save the world is the perfect place to end. <laughs> Thank you very much all for coming and join us upstairs. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.